Say, neighbor, did you hear him? He said, Acts, the first chapter, fourth to the first ver fifth verse, I'm sorry. Apostle, it's funny because you started talking about that storm, and I was in the middle of studying that last night, and I was so amped up. I had a good one, too. I thought it was going to be good. It was, I was warmed. I was ready. It was going to be called, it's not on me, it's in me. And it's talking about the fact that the storm was pouring out all over the boat. And Jesus was on the stern and he's asleep. And the water is coming over and he's getting wet. Yeah, but he's asleep. Like, who does that? But the storm was touching his body but not disrupting his peace. And I was going to go there. I was ready. And then I woke up at 4.30 this morning, and I remembered that it, Pentecost is coming. And you said whatever he lays on my heart. That's what you told me in that text message. You said it. It was you. And so with that, he took me to Acts, and I'm going to read 4 and 5, and then we're going to dig in. It says, gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard of from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Father, we thank you for this moment. We're so grateful, God, that you decided to speak to us today. And so I pray, Father, you do just that. Speak to all of us. Let it come out of my mouth and turn right back to my ear and let me hear what you have to say. None of me, all of you, this is my request, and it shall be done in Jesus' name. Amen. As you're going down to your seats, I wish you would just nudge your neighbor and say, Neighbor, we have just entered the waiting room. I was, I was a few months ago, I had to go to uh, a doctor's um, appointment over in Fort Sam Houston. And while I was there, when I walked in, the receptionist, uh, she, she checked me in. She gave me a packet. It seemed like a book of papers that I had to fill out. I filled out all the paperwork, and I sat. And I sat for a good hour and a half. If you know anything about a military uh, hospital, when I tell you waiting is what I did, I sat, I, I, I sat, and I sat. I sat so long till I moved seats. I was thinking they knew I was sitting there, so maybe if I moved, they'd think I'm a different patient or something. I sat, and so finally the doctor, the, the, one of the airmen come out to get me. I go in the back, and the doctor comes in. And the doctor does all the tests uh, on my wrist. I, I got a wrist injury, whatever. So they, they tested it. They, she looked at it. She looked at it. She made me move it. It hurt, all that stuff. I cried a little bit. I did. It, like one tear. It hurt. Um, and then she got up. She said, well, I'm done. So what's going to happen is when I go, my nurse is going to come in, and she's going to close out your visit. Nurse came in about hmm, 10, 15 minutes later, and she proceeds to check me out. And it hit me. The doctor did all the tests, but the nurse the logistical work. The doctor had the knowledge of my body's makeup. The nurse had all the information about my vitals. We find ourselves in a very unique situation in the scripture because we're at the point where the doctor has ascended. Oh, man. And he says, you're about to encounter the nurse. 
You've never really heard anybody call the Holy Spirit a nurse, but I tell you this much, I found him to be. He, <laughs> he's a nurse. He's one that will come in and whatever's going on with you, he's able to make an assessment to give the doctor. God, I feel him now. Oh, man, help me. And what happens is we find ourselves in a point where now the, the doctor's gone. He goes up into a cloud and they look in there. This, I promise you, this is how I saw it in the scripture. Y'all pray. He said I was jovial. Get this. Um, there, Jesus goes up. And all of a sudden, they notice two dudes standing on each side. And they say, basically, what you looking for? Now, I'm from Charleston, South Carolina, so there are going to be some dangling participles. You, you English teachers, y'all hold on. I'm going to get better somewhere. Somewhere. Uh, they ask him, what, they asked him, what are you looking for? Just the same way he went up, he's going to come down. Now, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I need to sit that there so you'll understand what they were waiting on. Because oftentimes, the problem is, is we have a information that we're waiting on, a manifestation of, but we forgot. You got some promises that the Lord gave you years ago. But due to time and due to waiting and doing to all the things that go on, you have forgotten. So let's lay this, this, this background. We're in, we are now uh, going to talk about what Acts is about. Acts has a great historical value because it gives an accurate account of the establishment and spread of the early Christian movement. The book uh, presents interpretive value due to bridging the gap between the Gospels and the Epistles. It is at once the sequel to the fourfold gospel and the historical background to the Pauline epistles. I want you to wrap your mind around that. There's two things going on at the same time. Acts has outstanding doctrinal value, particularly in presenting the person and activity of the Holy Spirit. It also has a practical importance emphasizing missionary motives and methods and providing a glimpse into the inner life of the early church. Ancient manuscripts, I love this, assign various titles to the book, primarily Acts or Acts of the Apostles. Some say the author probably gave no title to the book since the book emphasizes the work of only two apostles, and that's Peter and Paul. They suggest a more appropriate title might be the Acts of the Ascended Lord or the Acts of the Holy Spirit. This book is all about the Holy Spirit. I want you to understand when you read Acts, you're not reading about Jesus. You're reading about the Holy Spirit. That's important because you want a relationship with somebody you got to know about them. This is a good book to learn about your comforter. The abrupt close of the book indicates its date. At the time Acts was written, Paul had been in prison at Rome for two years. Having arrived there in the spring of AD 60, according to the best evidence, therefore, the book must have been written about the year AD 62. We find the purpose of Acts, here we go, in the very first verse which implies that the book is a continuation of the Gospel of Luke. So I know you've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But the way in, in chronological order would be Matthew, Mark, Luke, Acts. Which means in order for you to understand how Acts enters, you've got to understand how Luke exits. Because most of us are getting excited about a word, but we don't understand its origin. We get excited about what God is saying, but we don't know why he said it. So we are exiting the crucifixion. <laughs> Your Jesus. We have, you know, the one that you talk proudly about but don't know much about. Uh -oh. We are exiting his death and we are walking into his ascension and then the entrance of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. 
In his gospel, Luke spoke of what Jesus' spirit made flesh began to do and teach. And in Acts, he tells what the risen Lord continues to do and teach through spirit-empowered believers. Acts 1 and 8 suggests the plan of the book with the church expanding from its beginnings in Jerusalem to the surrounding areas of Judea and Samaria. And then to Gentile regions, including the capital city of Rome itself. The book of Acts provides the basic history of the spread of Christianity during three decades immediately following the death and resurrection of Jesus. In one book is three decades. Oh, my goodness. God is so amazing that he'll put so much in one thing. I'll get to you in a minute. The books of Acts is part two of a two-volume work addressed to Theophilus. Name means lover of God or friend of God. From Luke, Luke was a physician, co-worker, companion of Paul. He was the only Gentile, noun Jew, sorry, non-Jew, written um, writer of the Bible. The first volume, Gospel of Luke, informed Theophilus about the life and work of Jesus. The second part concerns itself with the ministry of the followers of Christ. That's you. Now, the reason why I'm building this groundwork is because in order for us to really deal with the promise we've been given, we have to understand who he gave it to. He didn't give it to the you that you are, the you you act like. He didn't give it to the, the complainer, you. He didn't give it to the procrastinator, me. He didn't give it to the, the slow-moving me. But he gave it to the me that believes him and moves according to his promise. I have to help you right quick because before you can ever require or demand the manifestation of a promise God gave you, you've got to be the person he gave it to. We're walking into Pentecost and all of us are going to praise God, but some of us are going to be lost. Because we're not the we, the me I'm supposed to be when the promise shows up. I don't even qualify for what he said, even though he said it to me. I'm sorry that hurt a little bit because I, 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 I find myself delayed in some areas because I chose not to move quickly enough to be what God had called me to be when he promised me what he promised. I find myself a little, uh, with a little bitter taste in my mouth because some of the things I'm asking for now, I don't have and I could have had years ago had I just been what he called me to be. Am I the only one in the room that finds themselves a little behind? Uh, all right. I might be the only one in the room that finds himself a little delayed right now, and I keep asking God, why, why? And he's asking me the same thing. Why? Why won't you get yourself right? Okay. Okay, because he don't talk to you like that. He talked to me like that. What's wrong with you, boy? Don't you know I want to give you everything, but I need you to be you like I designed you to be. Uh, I'm talking to some people in the room right now and that you need to hold your head up. I, I tell my trainees we take rebuke the same way we take correction, and that's what our head held up. I got to see God. And I got to watch him tell me what's going on with me so that I can get me right so he can be to me what he promised. We like to say, God has made me a promise. Me spoken. He promised me. 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 And we talk all about, I think my wife did a study of 7,920 some odd promises in the Bible that he's given me. 27,920 <laughs> some odd promises about me to me. And I'm missing some of them because I won't be right. Okay. Um, I want to leave that, but the problem I got with me right now, I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to me. If you find you in where I'm talking about, jump in. But the problem I got with me right now is I'm hoping for things. And we have these amazing services. And the Lord says, that could be yours if you get right. 
Uh, I wish you would just put your hand up, just one hand, and say, Lord, I just want to be right. And not right for your promise, just right. Because that's what we do. That's what I do. That's what I do. I adjust my posture to receive in my convenience. Did you hear what I just said? I said I, I find myself praying when I need. I find myself tarrying when I need. And I don't find myself properly positioned normally for God to do whatever. He opened up the windows of heaven, but it won't drop anything on me because I've got a covering called sin. It's like a barrier that stops me from receiving. It's going to get better, I promise. I know y'all looking at me like, come on already. This is the, the disciples we find right now because they have been doubting Jesus the whole time he's been working miracles. They have been struggling internally to fully accept what he is. Even in the story, he says, what manner of man is this? What, who, what's going on where he's speaking the winds move or stop moving? They're confused by who he is. That's where we find ourselves with a promise and confusion. But here you find Jesus has ascended. You find the angels standing saying, hey, he's not going to drop the promise where he said it. Uh, I want to talk to some of us who've been sitting in one spot waiting for the promise to hit us right where he said it. He said it in the church does not mean he's going to hit you at your seat. But as you are going to where he's called you to, yeah, as you are going to, to, to the destination he's called you to, that's where you'll see the promise manifested. He tells them, he says, this is not it. You got to move. So they do something that is amazing. They are at Mount Olive when they hear the promise. But they go a Sabbath day journey, a Sabbath day journey. It's about 2,000 cubits or a mile and a half or a third. I think of, some say a mile and a half. Some say three-fourths of a mile away from where they heard the promise. And the reason being is because on the Sabbath, you could only venture a certain distance before you broke the law. And the reason being is because if you move any way further than that 2,000 cubits, then what happens is you broke the law because you decided to put your focus on your journey instead of the day. Yeah. Oh, man. They decided to position themselves just with inside of the cubits so that they would not neglect the moment yeah. and they would still be able to qualify for the promise. I want to talk to somebody who heard a promise decided to do too much yeah. he promised you you gonna preach and you gonna prophesy so you out in the parking lot giving them out <laughs> yeah promised you that you were gonna make all the money in the world so you start investing in and in, in not and in not investing in yourself but you're investing in things that make no sense Make no, I said sense for real. No sense or dollars for that matter. You are breaking your bank trying to fabricate what he promised. Uh, and he says if you would just, just, just wait. Ah, uh, that's the problem. We don't want to wait. Ah, uh, we don't like waiting because waiting hurts. Waiting stinks. It it, it, it causes you to get antsy and, 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 and cause anxiety. Why? Because you feel like, and it should have happened by now. Oh, y'all don't want to talk back to me. You feel like I'm in a place I should have been out of a long time ago. God, why is it taking so long? And he says, just, just wait. Just wait. It's coming. I hear the scripture, I think it's in Hebrews, where it says, yet a little while. He who said he will come shall come and he will not tarry. Tell somebody's in a hurry. But just wait. I feel my mama right now. Just, I, just, just, just do me a favor. Wave your hand side. This is how she used to do me. And she would say, wait on him, baby. He coming. He coming. 
Oh, my goodness, he coming. Just, ah, he coming. The problem with waiting is we don't understand time. And the reason why we don't understand time is because the only time we've ever invested our knowledge or our time of investigating is the time of our watch. We, we investigate 24 hours in a day. We investigate, you know, 30 to 31, sometimes February, 28, 29-ish days in a month. We investigate 12 months in a year, but we, rea- we don't realize that God is moving in and out of our time, but he is time itself. Now, that's important because if he's time itself, then he can either go back in time, stay in time, or go in the future. So he's here, here, and there. There's three forms of time that that we see in, in, in the Bible or in biblical reference, and it's kairos, there's chronos, and the third is epoch. Kairos is, is, is the ancient Greek word meaning the right or opportune moment. The supreme moment is that amazing moment. That one you hope for. It signifies a time in between a moment of undetermined period of the time in which something special happens. It refers to opportunity. In New Testament, it means the appointed time in the purpose of God, uh, uh, the time when God acts. That's what we're hoping for. That's what the disciples are hoping for. Then you have chronos. It's uh, quantitative. quantitative. It's, uh, Kairos has a quantitative nature, but chronos is quantified. It is the timeline. It is like uh, you were born on this day. You had your teeth cut on this day. You started eating meat on this day. You going on your first date on this day. You, you know time. Your timeline is your start, your middle, your ending. But then you have that epoch. It is where we get the word epic from. It is the moment in which something actually happens. I'm sorry I get excited because I realize how close we are. This is the week prior to Pentecost. I have to sit myself in the mind of the disciples at this point because now all the talking is over. Jesus has already talked about all the things that will happen after he leaves. And now he has died, he has risen, he has shown up for 40 days, and he's ascended. Where is my promise? I have to put myself in the mind of the disciples because I start thinking, what was it like those next 10 days? What was it like to be able to feel the anticipation building up because you feel like, I don't know how, but I know any day now God is going to do Just what he said. You ever been there where you got that funny suspicion that something was about to go down? I don't know what he about to do, but I feel like I'm close. It's the feeling you get after you done worked all day and you get closer and closer to your home and you got in your mind taking off your shoes. Huh? Getting a good meal because Sundays are for church and good meals, huh? Yeah, you you get your mind ready. For that moment. And that moment you feel like it's there. Now watch this. Here's the crazy thing. He says right prior to saying wait, he says no man knows the appointed time. So I, oh, we got it. We, we, we who are sitting here, we have hindsight, but the disciples are clueless and hopeful. Oh, man, have you ever been in a place where you clueless and hopeful? <sighs> You know he said something, but you don't know when it's going to happen. But you're walking around like, where is it? I know he put it around here somewhere. I know when I get to church, apostle going to say something, and it's going to be what I was looking for. You ever been, you ever been excited to go somewhere? Because you know, man, at some point in time, it's about to go down. This is where we find the disciples. They are now clear that it's not happening in the cloud. (laughs) So what they do is they position themselves about 2,000 cubics in a place called the upper room. Now, I'm not going to go too far. 
Okay, all right. I, you notice I walk this way? All right. I tell you, thank you. My wife said, mind your business. I said, well, if he tell me I can go. Well, he just told me, leave me alone. They find themselves now in a place called the upper room. <laughs> and you got to remember the scripture says he will not be how he went up. I'm sorry, back up, rewind. He says, as he went up, that's how he's coming down. Uh, now, my mama told me this way. She said in the upper room, they were all in one place and in one accord. And then suddenly there was a. There was a suddenly. OK, there was a suddenly. I, I want to pause before I say another thing. And I want to tell you, you need to praise God now for your suddenly. Yep. I got a funny suspicion that in the next few days. Suddenly it's going to happen. I wish I had somebody that would witness with me that I don't know what God is going to do, but I feel a suddenly welling up inside my soul. I feel a suddenly. I, my God, hold on, don't rush me. I feel a suddenly. And the reason why I feel a suddenly is because my understanding is now that I know God is going to do what he said. And I know he won't do it here. So I'm going to position myself. How did they position themselves? It says in one place and in one accord. That one accord means they've been in this room praying. I hear the song say, just keep on praying. The Lord is nigh. Just keep on praying. Hear, hear your cry. The Lord has promised. His word is true. Just keep on praying. He'll answer you. This is the mindset we find the disciples in, in the upper room. They're in a place now where their anticipation has turned into praying for the promise. Uh, you can't just get antsy because you feel like it's coming. But you got to pray until something happens. Tell somebody, keep on praying. That's what you got to do. You got to keep on praying. Don't get weary and well-doing, for in due season, he shall reap. You shall reap if you faint not. Just tell some, keep on praying. That's what you do. You stay on your knees and pray. That's what you do. You stay in your private place, your place and pray. They got in this room. They begin to pray. Things got hot. It got turned up. We did five nights. They were in that mug for about 10 days praying. And they didn't pray for the 50th day. See, y'all, y'all missing something. They had no clue. It didn't get called Pentecost until after it happened. <laughs> they had no clue. They just were praying. Can I tell you this? I don't know where in between the time you heard your promise uh, and you're praying that God is going to do it, but I know this much. Uh, they tell me faith is the key. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> get that out of there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to find out how bad do you want it? Are you willing to pray until it happens? I see what's on your face. It's weariness. Yeah, it's exhaustion. But keep praying. I see what's in your body. It's a slump over like, man, I'm tired. You don't know. Like I know. Not what the Lord has done, what I'm going through. Nobody knows, but just keep on praying. I wish you would just tap yourself on the chest and say, don't give up. Don't quit. Because according to Scripture, we are about 10 days away. <sighs> From everything he's promised you happening. Matter of fact, not everything, but the most important thing he's promised you. There is somebody in this room you say but haven't felt. If you save and you got the Holy Spirit, you know that feeling. Ooh, and you want to shut yourself up, but it keeps on talking. 
where you want to sit still, but you having what we call a whole Baptist fit. You can't, you wondering, I want to keep my hands so, but I, I tell your neighbor, that's what you're praying for. Let's make no mistake about it. The doctor has already seen us. I said, seen us. S E E N E D. That's a real word in the East Coast. Seen us is if you go up north a little bit. He done seen you. And he's already given his diagnosis. And he knew you would struggle. <laughs> he knew that what you are about to face because of your inf- affliction would need, you're going to need some help. So he said, what I'll do is I'll give you a comforter. I want to say this to you as I'm, as I'm shutting up. I said that is you're so close. You are so close. I'm not talking to you, you individuals that, you know, you feel like you, you've obtained. I'm talking to the ones who are still, you eating and still hungry. It's like something just won't satisfy. No one can satisfy. Nobody else. And he's saying, I'm about to send that to you. Everybody stand in. Come on. I want to talk to only one person. And that's the hungry. This is not for those of you that are sad, comfortable where you are. But I'm talking to the people that sit on the edge of their bed at night and say, there's got to be more. No way it could just be this. No way it could just be pandemic. No way it could just be internal health issues. No way it can just be turmoil in my relationship. There's got to be more. And you've you've concluded nobody else can help me but God. If that's you, I want you to come on. 